Welcome to the next video in the evolution series. This video is going to be looking at three dot points from the evolution of Australian biota syllabus 8.5.32, compare and contrast external and internal fertilization 8.5.3b, identify data sources, gather, process and analyze information from secondary sources and use available evidence to discuss the relative success of internal and external fertilization in relation to the colonization of terrestrial and aquatic environments, and 8.5.33, discuss the relative success of these forms of fertilization in relation to the colonization of terrestrial and aquatic environments. So as we can see, the three of them fit together quite nicely. Start off by looking at the differences and similarities between external and internal fertilization, then having a look at how these are successful in moving plants, sorry, moving plants and animals from aquatic to terrestrial environments, but also populating aquatic environments. So let's start off by looking at what fertilization is. We've looked at what meiosis is, which is the production of gametes. So fertilization is then what happens after uh, these gametes are produced and organisms undergo the process of sexual reproduction and the egg and the sperm come together. When the egg and the sperm come together, the first cell that is produced is referred to as a zygote and then it undergoes massive amounts of mitosis to divide over and over and over again in order to produce a new organism, which then becomes an embryo, a fetus, and then eventually uh, the offspring of the organism. So fertilization can occur internally or externally. So let's start by having a look at internal fertilization. So Organisms that live on land face the problem of sex cells and the developing zygote drying out. So most multicellular land organisms, the female sex cell is fertilized inside the female organism. So this occurs when the male gamete, being the sperm, is introduced to the egg inside the female. So it takes place in most multicellular land organisms, being both plant and animals. So during intercourse with um, animals, a large number of male gametes are released into the female. However, there is only a small number of female gametes available for fertilization. So if we think about this in terms of humans, during um, ovulation, usually only one egg is released uh, by the female's ovaries and that travels to the uterus. During the process of sexual reproduction in, in humans, a large number of sperm are then introduced into the female. and with the uh, sort of aim of one of those sperm fertilizing the egg. As a result, we have a small number of zygotes forming. As we know, during human reproduction, majority of um, pregnancies result in only one uh, baby being born. Sometimes we have twins, but then as we move into higher numbers, the chances of those pregnancies taking place are much less. So due to the internal protection, uh, we usually end up with a more successful fertilization. So plants and animals that carry out internal fertilization, even though they only produce a small number of animals, or so, sorry, small number of offspring, those offspring uh, are usually brought into the world successfully, safely, because of all this internal protection from the environment. So on the other hand, external fertilization occurs when the male gamete, so the sperm, is introduced to the female gamete eggs outside of the female. Okay, so if you remember the opening scenes of Finding Nemo as we've got there, okay, the female lays lots and lots of eggs. The male then comes and deposits his sperm over the top and those eggs then become fertilized. So the reason why this is helpful is organisms in water do not face the same problems as land animals, such as the cells drying out. So cells need to stay moist um, in order to be able to survive. So the male and female organisms do not necessarily have to be in contact for this type of fertilization to occur. So the female can come and lay her eggs. The male can come along at a later date and deposit his sperm. As we can see from the two pictures there, uh, large numbers of both male and female gametes are released and a large number of zygotes form as a result. Okay, so all of these cells that are here in this jelly sort of image in the bottom here are uh, all individual fish spawn that have began to grow as a result of fertilization. Obviously, we, re we recall back to Finding Nemo. Uh, the beginning of the movie, the barracuda comes in. Uh, 
the dad isn't able to protect all of his eggs. So as we know, all of them end up being eaten apart from one. So there's not the same type of protection available for um, cells that are fertilized externally. And as a result, it's not very not a very successful form of fertilization. So even though we may have hundreds of eggs being fertilized, depending on circumstances, not any of those individuals may actually survive. So this table is a nice comparison of external and internal fertilization. So during external fertilization, the male gametes swim to the female gametes, whereas in internal fertilization, the male gametes are introduced inside the female reproductive tract. In external fertilization, male gametes are shed into a large space meaning that there is actually less chance of survival, whereas in internal fertilization, the male gametes are released into a confined space in very close proximity to the female gametes, so there's obviously a much higher chance of fertilization taking place. In external fertilization, many female gametes are produced. However, in internal fertilization, only a few female gametes are produced, and as we said, with humans, it's usually only one egg that's released a month during the process of ovulation. With external fertilization, zygotes develop outside both the male and the female parents, so there's absolutely no real contact between the developing zygotes and the parents, whereas with internal fertilization, the zygote develops protected within the inside of the female parent. External fertilization is most common in fish and amphibians, as we said, those that live in aquatic environments, where internal fertilization is most common in mammals, birds, and reptiles. So those animals that live on land and have the issues of drying out. So the next part of the syllabus dot points that we're looking at ask us to look at the relative successes of these different types of fertilization. So Natural selection eliminates inherited characteristics and individuals if they fail to confer advantages or adaptations to the next generation. Okay, so basically what that means is organisms need to evolve or they die and become extinct. So we know that um, through the processes of fertilization, we have different combinations of egg and sperm coming together, which leads us to variation within our population, which therefore leads to natural selection, allowing, um, or allowing natural selection to take place. Uh, it is logical that through an analysis of the current methods of fertilization, both terrestrial and aquatic, or of both uh, terrestrial and aquatic organisms, we should be able to determine which methods are most successful for the respective environments. And hopefully already by now, you would have sort of been putting it in your head that one type of fertilization suits one type of environment and the other type of fertilization suits a different type of environment. So generally, internal fertilization is the norm in terrestrial environments and external fertilization is the norm in aquatic environments. So external fertilization generally requires a large production of gametes because there is much higher losses of zygotes, so we don't have as many individuals being formed. But bear in mind that sperm may also be produced, so many sperm are also produced for internal fertilization. So mollusks are an example of an organism that have a long evolutionary history where aquatic members have evolved external fertilization and terrestrial members have um, evolved to be able to fertilize internally. So mollusks such as um, clams and things that live in the water are able to reproduce externally, where snails that live on land actually uh, reproduce internally. So very similar evolutionary um, organisms. So they've come from the same evolutionary path, but they've been able to adapt through this process of natural selection to be able to uh, fertilize their sperm and eggs in different ways based on where they live. And that brings us to the end of this video. So thank you for watching.